welcome to 40th lecture of video course on travelogy. Topic of the present lecture is hydrostatic bearings. In previous lecture, we studied porous bearing, a bearing which has pores uh, in a range of 16 to 36 percent. Pores are required to store the lubricant and whenever there is a need, the lubricant would be released and pumped back also. So, releasing and uh, storing back the information is very important aspect of the porous bearings. So, in first uh, few slides we will again uh, revise about the porous bearing, then we will try to connect porous bearing with hydrostatic bearings. There is a lot of similarity between these two bearings. Subsequently, we will be doing some sort of uh, mathematical calculation to estimate load carrying capacity of hydrostatic bearing. One typical example will be covered in the present lecture. So, let us start with the porous bearings. This is a very popular in a number of applications which have a relatively low load and relatively low speed. Those applications are like a small electric motors. Naturally, power is not very high to apply load will be smaller, lesser. Similarly, we have a number of applications related to household appliances, some automotive accessories which do not need much load or do not impose very high load. In those situations, porous bearings can be utilized. Typical porous bearings which have been utilized are bronze related material, iron copper, these are mostly metal based porous bearing, iron copper carbon, bronze iron and aluminum. Interesting thing is that wherever there is a copper, there are thermal conductivity is higher and speed or speed of operation is relatively higher side. You can see bronze and aluminum they have a relative speed a 6.1 meter per second. But if I compare with the percentage of iron, so even in this case uh, iron and copper is here, but copper has been reduced to 10 percent. In bronze it is uh, percentage of 90 percent, while in iron is a 90 percent, iron copper, iron percentage is a 90 percent. So, this is lower 1.1. But what is the advantage? We are getting high MPA, high pressure limit for iron copper that is a 140 mega Pascal. Increasing iron percent with the addition of carbon, this maximum limit is increased from 140 to 340. So, that is advantages. Uh, permissible speed of operation is reduced that is a comparison when we require very high speed operation not very high speed is a relatively high speed operation then we can choose the bronze we can choose aluminum. When we require high load applications even uh, I mentioned the porous bearing should not be used for the heavy load, but what we arrange in upper bound of that we can utilize iron based bearings with iron uh, copper or iron copper carbon which is a maximum limit is 340 and 140. Similarly, in this case the PV limit has been uh, decided based on product of the pressure and velocity. Now, question comes there are two columns of maximum pressure or pressure limit. One says it is a static, other says it is a dynamic. So, whenever there is a dynamic load permissible limit is reduced due to dynamism all will not get sufficient time to leak out from the pores and go back in the pores. So, that is why we require lesser pressure compared to the static cases. This is the permissible limit for dynamic cases is lesser maybe say almost a 50 percent compared to static cases. These are the common materials which we can utilize for uh, porous bearings. Now, let us uh, see about the way so that get information about the coefficient of friction. Compared to the 
dry bearing coefficient of friction will be lesser because there is a supply of lubricant even the intermediate supply of lubricant but it's still the lubricant is there and what we are doing we are trying to calculate average coefficient of friction and that gives a range of the 0.05 to 0.15 actually this is a preferable compared to the dry bearing a treatment design analysis is more or less same for porous bearing as well as dry bearing let us take uh, some example, uh, so one example, not some examples, so one example for the porous bearing. Before uh, considering that example, uh, we are just giving uh, some uh, guidelines so that this bearings, porous bearings, whenever we select, we prefer short bearing, short in the sense the length to diameter ratio need to be relatively smaller. We can keep in the range of 0 0.5 to 1.5. However, many bearings have been used with a very large albedo ratio, but particularly for porous bearing, particularly for dry bearing, we do not keep very high albedo ratio. And if it is required, we cannot change the dimension, we cannot change the diameter, bow diameter, and we need to support relatively large load, then instead of one large bearing, one long bearing we will prefer two short bearings that will give better solution that will be having some adaptability to the misalignment. Now, let us go on a point comes uh, how to design a porous bearing we can consider one example. So, a shaft running at the 1000 rpm 1000 rotations per minute is supported on a porous bearing. Shaft dia is given as a 1 inch that means 25.4 mm and L by D is equal to 1, whatever the diameter it is the uh, length is equal to same. Now, applied load is been given in a uh, font and that is uh, 1200 LBF. For this kind of bearing, whichever the bearing we have been mentioning, we are not mentioning the material, but relevant data have been given over here. So, velocity limit, maximum velocity is 1180 feet per minute, pressure limit is in a given a psi and that is equal to 2000 psi. We can convert in a mega Pascal, we can convert this in atmospheric pressure, but for time being all the data have been given same unit, we will go ahead with this unit. And the PV limit is been given as a 110 k psi feet per minute. We can utilize the formula and see the result whether the result is satisfactory or not. We will do first calculation, we say the calculation of average pressure load divided by area and that is turning out to be 8.27 ampere and uh, that is uh, lesser than what has been recommended or given to us. Second comes the velocity, velocity is also turning out to be lesser than uh, what has been mentioned maximum limit uh, 261 feet per minute has been uh, calculated and which is a uh, lesser than permissible. However, PV limit, PV limit which is uh, coming as a product is very high, it is a 313 kilo psi feet per minute and what is a permissible, permissible is a 110, so almost a one third is a permissible and this value is very high while well, pressure was a 2000 psi and we are getting lesser than that and velocity limit was a is a 1180 again what we are getting that is a lesser. So, that is a what we are saying um, maybe will be better uh, if we bearing is a safe from pressure point of view from a velocity point of view and uh, is a unsafe from PV limit point of view. So, how to demonstrate that? So, that let us see this is a pressure axis, this is a velocity axis and these are the terminal velocities, maximum allowable uh, velocity and is a maximum pressure of allowable pressure. If we connect this that is generally giving as a PV line, PV approach. Now, if this is a maximum pressure which we are getting this is a maximum velocity which we are getting. So, from absolute point of view, from pressure point of view, we are uh, bearing this way because uh, generated pressure is a lesser than maximum allowable pressure, while velocity is also 
lesser than permissible velocity. But we try to project this, this point, operating point comes on there here, which is far away, which is a far away from permissible PV limit. So, this bearing is going to fail because of the heating, because of the low heat dissipation and this bearing rate we will not be able to, uh, we will not be able to estimate, we will not be able to find the life of this bearing using PV limit or PV approach reason being this bearing is ongoing, undergoing uh, excessive wear, it is crossed the PV limit and after that mild wear equations cannot be used. So, this is a, a brief about how to utilize a PV approach for the porous bearing and uh, find out whether the bearing is going to survive or not. If bearing is able to survive, then we can recommend, we can find out what will be life using the wear equation. But if it is already crossing the PV limit, we will not be able to find because the bearing is going to fail, a wear rate is much faster An ordinary archer equation cannot be used for this purpose. Now, this is what we mentioned the operating point. Now, you see uh, I mentioned that we try to connect this porous bearing with hydrostatic bearing. It is a very um, crude idea to think porous bearing and hydrostatic bearing and correlation between that. But let me take some example, let us say that I am trying to relate porous bearing with hydrostatic bearing and this is a porous bearing, this is a bore of porous bearing and the outer diameter of porous bearing. What we can do? We can develop this surface. I can cut from one point and stretch it in one plane. Now, this can be done like that. So, this, this slab is more like a development of this bearing at this cylinder, this hollow cylinder. This is the development of this hollow cylinder. Now, if I do a cross section, if I can pass a cunning cutting plane now uh, from uh, this slab, what I will be able to see, there will be some pores like this, maybe equally spaced or equally spaced depends. For time being, I am assuming this uh, spacing may be not very uniform, but when we pass a cutting plane, we are going to see some pores in that. This is a cross section, this is cross section where the cutting plane is touching the surface, but there is a hole over here and these holes are required to transfer oil from reservoir to the surface. That is why the, there are voids, maybe not connected completely, but they are connected one way or another way. Under pressure they get release and they release a liquid and uh, they are able to pass a liquid from one corner of the bearing to other corner of bearing, from one surface of bearing to other surface of bearing and this is exactly structure of hydrostatic bearing. If I use a pump somewhere here, try to connect all these pipes, obviously I am assuming these are the pipes or all capillaries and feed or pump liquid lubricant or maybe say that even we can compress or we can pass the compressed gases from the this pores, those will reach to the side. And that is a what we are trying to convey that uh, this kind of uh, structure can be related to hydrostatic bearing. Or we can say this kind of arrangement is a hydrostatic bearing with orifice compensator. There are a number of orifices in this and uh, this is a compensator. What is the meaning of compensator? See when we require we have only one pump and we want to connect all the holes with that pump. These things uh, these orifices will work as a compensator. Uh, we will be requiring individual pump for individual uh, hole or individual uh, orifice. We will be requiring too many pumps in those situations. That is why we go ahead with this kind of orifice compensator so that there is a some pressure loss, but there is a stability of operation. I can uh, see whenever your word uh, hydrostatic comes, there is a need to give external pressure. Or in other word, we can say externalized pressure, externally pressurized bearing or hydrostatic bearing, they are synonymous. I externally pressurized, we require some kind of arrangement like this. Say so, there is a, some piping, there is a pump, liquid is getting sucked in the pump and getting forced in the bearing and there is an inlet oil inlet. Is a pumping the liquid when it is like the liquid is getting pumped naturally, shaft will be moved, will be displaced from the point of contact. 
because the liquid is getting pumped in that. I am sure the pumped liquid will be having slightly larger value compared to minimum value which is required uh, to lift this shaft and that is what uh, all about the hydrostatic bearing. Now, question comes do we require only one hole or do we require too many holes? In uh, reality, we require too many holes to make it stable, to provide a stable operation. And this is a what? We use a word a multi pocket hydrostatic bearing. You can see there are pockets, there are restrictors like what we have shown on our previous uh, slide with the porous bearing, those are um, restrictors, orifice, and can maybe. Um, capillary action also and we are using these pockets. These pockets act as a reservoir and avoid any pulsation in liquid. If you do not use this, there will be a lot of pulsation, a lot of instability, a lot of turbulence. To avoid that, that is why we are using this kind of pockets. It is more like a bathtub for the bearing at the localized domain. And this, this is the one side view, this is the other side view. We are able to show here pockets are not through through length, not from one end to other end. If we provide, we will be doing mistake. Reason being because of this pocket, liquid will be simply moved out. It will not be acting as a reservoir. It will be simple in the basic canal sort of thing. From one side liquid is coming and other side is going out without any supporting or without any support to the shaft. So, that is why we require um, blind slot, there is no through and through slot, when the liquid comes it should remain in that slot, it should not be simply skipped from the surface. So, that is a major purpose of this. Now, it can be uh, as you use the word a multi pocket, it can be 6 pocket or 8 pockets or 12 pockets, generally we use even number of pockets. So, that there is a basic stability. What does it mean a basic stability? Say so, whatever the force comes in from this direction, there should be something opposite to that. That means I can or we say we can regulate motion of the shaft, whatever the force we are providing from one side, there should be opposite force and overall control algorithm which will be required to position the shaft will be simpler. If you use uh, odd numbers, then algorithm may be slightly more difficult, but with even number algorithm is very really simple. So, what we say this kind of hydrostatic bearings remove completely wear, no wear chance, completely shaft is uh, levitated, no metal to metal contact, if there is no metal to metal contact naturally there will not be any wear. And um, generally relative speed in this kind of bearing is very small, so aberration of the surface because of the liquid also will not be there. In addition, coefficient of friction is almost 100, 1 by 50, uh, 500 times of drive friction. That is significantly low, and that is a major advantage. In addition, they show high stiffness because this kind of the bearings are generally required to position the shaft. And whenever the we require positioning the shaft, even there is a change in the load applied on the shaft or supporting surfaces, there should not be much variation in the position of the shaft. That is why we require very high stiffness. Uh, in other words, I can represent this say film thickness at the any point, film thickness at any point need to be related to with the W. Naturally, if the W is increasing, film thickness is going down, is going to decrease. And that is having a 1 by 3, obviously, it is a cubic root of this, it should be minus 1 by 3. So, it is a cubic root of W, the sensitivity is much smaller, it is not a very high. Or when the sensitivity towards the deflection is very small, naturally, stiffness is very high. Now, we are saying that we are talking about the high stiffness, that is a major advantage of hydrostatic bearing. In addition, there are some other advantages. We say this kind of bearings are good for starting and stopping. 
this has been utilized because when we consider the hydronomic bearing maybe in next lecture, then we will be able to find there are always a problems with hydronomic bearing during starting and stopping. And here we are using the word over here this hydrostatic bearing is good for starting and stopping naturally we can hybridize hydrostatic and hydrodynamic bearing to make overall the best bearing. A combination gives the best results. We require good characteristics at the initial point. We require good characteristics under running conditions. One bearing provides a good characteristic at the start and stopping. Other bearing gives a very good characteristic during the running time and we want both. We want win-win situation. Naturally, we need to go with hybridization of the bearing. That is what the emphasis has been given. These bearings are good for starting and stopping. And uh, this is a major uh, a point for the hydrostatic bearing. We will see these bearings are the best. These bearings are the best for heavy load. Also, maybe we can use the word extremely heavy load. Load which cannot be supported by any other source. And required uh, main if the requirement is also that extremely low friction. Take an example of big size telescopes. Rotation may be required a few degree. Not a single rolling element bearing, not a hydrodynamic bearing or any other bearing can be utilized. The rotation is very small and almost a negligible coefficient of friction is demanded. Well, we require accuracy of even a 0.1 degree. In those situation, we do not have any other alternate other than hydrodynamic bearing or oh sorry hydrostatic bearings. We can think about the electromagnetic bearings and all, but compared to that these bearings are a better option. Now, interesting question comes, oh there are so many advantages of hydrostatic bearings why every bearing is not hydrostatic bearing, why do we use a rolling element bearing, why do I think about a hydrodynamic bearing, why I do think about a dry bearing. Everywhere there should be hydrostatic bearing because it gives a low friction, it gives neg negligible coefficient of friction, it gives a very high stiffness, it is very good for starting and stopping. Whatever situation you give, we are going to get a best results, but the cost the cost of these bearings are very high. Active control which is required for this kind of bearing is also important to maintain high stiffness. Always we need to believe on the capillary capacitors or uh, uh, compensators and orifice compensators or we may be requiring otherwise a constant volume pump. Another thing, pressure free which is required to feed the or to lift the shaft is generally very high. It can be in MPA, it can be 150 bar, 200 bars. So, if I had to supply that high pressure naturally I will be requiring a big pump, very high pressure lines and we know very well high pressure lines reliability is a major issue if it bust, if there is any crack whole unit will collapse. So, reliability will be a major issue and if we want very very reliable operation we need to go ahead with additional units. So, cost will be very 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 high compared to our ordinary bearings. So, this is not a first option and this should be always a last option because we are always cost conscious. Now, this uh, says a multi pocket and um, question comes what should be the depth of pocket and what is the restrictor. Let me say that the depth of pocket can be even uh, 50 to 100 times of film thickness. So, that it acts as a reservoir, it acts as a stabilizing agent, there should not be any turbulence and there is a slight variation even that because of the abundant liquid in this pocket there will not be much variation. So, depth of pocket should be around 50 to 100 times of the film thickness with the minimum film thickness requirement. If it is a 1 micron then depth of pocket should be 100 microns, if it is 2 micron it should be the 200 microns or more than that. 
but minimum value I am talking about the 50 to 100, 50 to 100 times of the film thickness. Then comes so what is the restricted you can able to see these are the restrictors. This can be the orifice or it can be capillary. Generally capillary there is a possibility of chalking because of the some dead particle and all and then whole operation will stop. So, either we require a very good filter with a capillary or where we can use a orifice which are not very sensitive towards the environmental dirt. So, depth of pocket need to be 50 to 100 times minimum value restrictor can be capacitor uh, can be capillary action or can be orifice can be utilized in those things. The question comes um, how to how to start calculation or to think about the load carrying capacity of these bearings. What will be the relation between load and film thickness? What will be the relation between the power supply or maybe even oil supply or supply pressure and film thickness? How to design these bearings? How to think about the designing these bearings? I will take a very simple example. So, I am assuming uh, this big shaft is supported only in one, one pocket for time being. Once we know the analysis for one pocket, we can go ahead with the vector algebra for the multi pockets. Relations are not going to change, only the supply conditions are going to change. Or different orientation, the forces will change, we can resolve it, we can find out overall stability analysis based on that. But first point is start with a one pocket. And this has been shown over here. Again, this is the one pocket over here, obviously, there is the hydrostatic lift. We are pumping the liquid from here, and because of that uh, pressurized liquid, this shaft is getting up, obviously, that is getting raised. Just for the convenience, I showed a so big uh, values. It can this can this this has been shown in the 90 degree extent. If I assume there is a line of axis uh, symmetry over here or axis over here, vertical and uh, from 0 to 90 degree in this side and 0 to 90 degrees this side. In actual case it may be much lesser than that and we need to account actual angle for time being we are using the 90 degree. And to estimate the load carrying capacity we need, we need to go back to the, our Reynolds equation which we have done or which we have derived in earlier relation or at least we go ahead with the initial equation what we say the flow equation because we want to know how much lubricant supply will be required to levitate this shaft because we are going to pump that liquid from the pump. So, for that purpose we are estimating we are assuming it is a assume a shaft of course, the dimension is much smaller is shown much smaller, but it can be much larger than this. The shaft has a radius of r being floated is a levitated in a bearing which has a radius capital R. So, what will be that now clearance? Uh, clearance will be the capital R minus small r that will be the clearance between bearing and the shaft. It has been uh, floated by oil which has been pumped through a slot at the pressure P s. We say the supply pressure is a P s assuming some supply pressure maximum value is a P s and uh, geometry has been defined radius of the shaft has been given radius of the bearing has been given and we can find out the clearance based on this. In addition to that we have shown somewhere here this symbol says E that means there is a bearing center and the shaft center. So, the shaft center may be uh, below than this because there is slight levitation and bearing center is above. So, there is eccentricity uh, some value and naturally it will be lesser than clearance value. Now, we start with the flow equation because we required how much flow is uh, how much liquid need to be pumped. This relation can be given in terms of flum thickness, in terms of viscosity, in terms of pressure gradient because there is will be some sort of pressure loss when it goes through the this kind of pockets and it has been depending on uh, it is depending also on the length of the bearing. We are assuming symmetry, we are assuming the even though we mentioned the pocket they will not be through and through from one slot to uh, one side to other side. For time being we are assuming for calculation purpose we are assuming the B is that otherwise we need to calculate actual depth of actual depth of pocket. So, if it is 80 percent of overall length of the bearing we should account 0.8 B otherwise uh, if it is 60 percent we should account 60 percent depends 
if you do the optimization or final results will come what kind of the length will be more suitable for our operation. So, q can be given in terms of uh, plumb thickness that is the h cube divided by 12 uh, eta uh, dp by r d theta this is a uh, r is a uh, r d theta is giving a one axis maybe the d x like uh, into the length. Here naturally the word is a variable it is a h over here and h is given by the c r which is a difference between capital R minus small r that is a c r minus e cos theta because we know film thickness is going to vary with the theta and I am assuming this line is at midpoint the theta is equal to 0. So, theta may vary in uh, anti clockwise and will vary in a clockwise when it varies in anti clockwise it can be treated as a negative direction when clockwise it can be treated as a positive direction, but when we are talking with the cos theta negative theta positive theta does not make any sense and has any same value it is not going to change. Right. So, what is being given here the C r minus E cos theta and we saw that this this the, this point the film thickness will be minimum other than this the film thickness will be larger and that has been reflected over here. Cos theta uh, is a 0 that is a C r minus E will be the minimum value and now we know as a theta increases from 0 to 90 degree the value of the cos theta is going to decrease and value of the cos theta is lesser than 1 when it has been multiplied naturally the flum thickness is going to increase or in other word minimum flum thickness is going to be at the point where the theta is 0 and that is a been uh, represented by this equation. Now we can go ahead one more step we say that uh, we are not interested in a cap uh, an absolute value of E we are more interested in epsilon and epsilon is a ratio of eccentricity to radial clearance. We know very well the maximum value of epsilon will be 1 and minimum value of epsilon will be 0. However, in the present situation there is a possibility the shaft center goes beyond the bearing center goes more above the bearing center. So, there is a possibility that E turns out to be negative. So, we are saying E will be positive when the uh, shaft center is a below the bearing center E will be negative when the shaft center is above the bearing center. There is a possibility we pump too much liquid supply too much pressure naturally this shaft will go up higher than um, bearing center or means that load carrying capacity is more than is a weight or whatever the load applied on that naturally it will go beyond the bearing center and this is a common situation when we are using or we are talking about the multi pocket bearings. So, we need to account the negative epsilon uh, or we say uh, negative value of eccentricity also. So, with this kind of thing we can take a C r as a common in bracket what will be 1 minus epsilon cos theta. Again when the cos theta is 0 naturally this will be maximum value 1 minus epsilon and when cos theta is a 90 degree naturally this will turn out to be maximum value overall this will be 0 and uh, this will be 1. And uh, in this way uh, we can uh, find we can estimate from thickness we can find out the q if we know what is the relation of p with the kind of the theta what is the what is the relation within uh, p and theta or if we know the theta we can find out what will be the relation between p and h because film thickness is going to continuously vary over here. So, for that purpose uh, what we can start we can say that uh, this is the LED theta over here we can substitute value of h in terms of theta C r is a constant for one situation for one equilibrium epsilon is also will remain constant it is not going to change for a static case for well, one particular case epsilon will remain constant. So, we substitute C r this epsilon is here then there is a cos theta and uh, we have a differential term theta. So, we can rearrange this equation we can integrate pressure over theta to find our pressure distribution with a theta. Now, we can do that by rearranging it something like this we say elemental pressure rises any point can be given as a dp in terms of this constant that is a 12 into radius into viscosity into flow rate. Here we are assuming we are going to supply at a constant volume volume is a constant 
you can say that this is an mm cube or meter cube per unit second. This volume rate is a constant. However, we can design similar bearing up making pressure as a constant at the supply point or at the constraint uh, at the restriction point. We have our choice for the better one is uh, thinking about the constant volume that is why we are assuming here the volume remains constant. I know this much volume is there and then we need to get the results. Length of the bearing is constant, C r cube is constant. So, this is a constant factor. Now, what we need to do integration d theta divided by 1 minus epsilon cos theta. There is a theta term here and we need to do integration and naturally we need to follow some sort of the table or we can go have the replacement and substitution to get the results what which we have done in the fluid lubrication part of this course. We go ahead with that slightly longer derivation comes I am not driving complete equations because we have done already two times this kind of thing and now I am just giving as it is the results. Let us see the pressure P is given this constant will remain constant and this term 1 minus epsilon cos theta cube will be given this way. There is a constant, uh, constant of integration that is a D over here. And whole this equation has been represented in terms of epsilon and sin theta. If I know this epsilon, I can really find out what will be the p at the various levels. Now, there is a, there are a number of terms and uh, we can solve it. We can say that d can be obtained, d can be obtained by using the input condition. We know at the theta is equal to 0, p is equal to p s p is equal to supply pressure at the slot or p is equal to the pressure at the slot entrance that can be utilized to find out what is the d over here. That is the one thing or we can use other boundary condition we can say that the theta is equal to 90 degree when theta is a 90 degree pressure will be 0 that is another boundary condition we can utilize. If we know the supply pressure I can find out from that or if I do not know the supply pressure, I can say okay, we know very well at the 90 degree or the exit where the pocket is existing uh, coming out naturally their pressure will not be their pressure will be zero. Both the condition can be utilized to get the results whichever I think is zero one is a zero condition directly substitute zero and so theta is this for 90 degree we can get, get the results or uh, theta is a theta one where the pressure is maximum uh, pressure is coming to the zero. We can use any condition we get the results and uh, when we that is as I mentioned the simpler one is the pressure is 0 at the theta degree 90 degree as per the was assumption. Now, thus using this p is equal to 0 at theta is equal to 90 degree what we get the d in terms of completely epsilon. Now, we can substitute this value over here and if uh, I was not knowing or we were not knowing initially what is the P s, we can find out directly P s by substituting theta is equal to 0. Once I know this d, substitute in this relation and if I know the epsilon and I know the parameter, I can find out what will be the pressure. Or we say, have we decided how much liquid should be pumped per unit second? Then we should be able to find out what will be the P s, what will be supply pressure which has been pumped from the pump and maybe is coming at the exit of the slot. Using these conditions we can find and that P s by using this relation can be calculated using this. Okay. This is completely based on epsilon or in other words change in epsilon is going to change the pressure supply. That is why we say that we are supplying with a constant volume and this P s is going to change with a changing in epsilon I will decrease or will increase depending on the value of epsilon. The question comes, we started this for finding the load carrying capacity of the bearing, but we are not yet to reach to the bearing load carrying capacity. What we are discussing only about the pressure, pressure relation naturally to find out the load carrying capacity we need to integrate over the area. And that is done like this, we say pressure P acts on area R d theta if I am trying to integrate assuming the uniform uh, variation that means into length of the bearing. As I mentioned uh, not necessary, we need to account uh, uh, overall length in this case, uh, we can think about the pocket length also. 
right. So, pressure P acts on the area this one and vertical component. So, naturally when we are talking about uh, bearing there will be always two components. We are talking about the polar coordinates. There will be one uh, component containing cos theta terms, other component will contain a sin theta terms. And generally when we are talking in the middle of the uh, symmetry, what will happen two sin theta terms will cancel each other or in other word what we are trying to convey. If I draw a line over here sin theta term will be this side, sin theta terms will be this side. So, half of this portion and half of this portion, this side portion those will be cancelled and whatever the cos theta terms along this will be added up and that is been shown earlier. Cos theta terms have been added to whatever the pressure relation have been added while sin theta terms are going to cancel each other. So, that is why we do not require uh, calculation of sin theta term, we are only concentrated on cos theta term. And you can see the boundary condition it is a 0 to pi by 2 because we are taking half 1 we assume there is a symmetry in both the sides and theta is 0 at the center line or the middle point. So, when we do uh, we substitute pressure relation which has been uh, shown in the previous slides we will be able to find out what is the W. How this uh, if, uh, if I we know that the, uh, W which has been applied we will be able to find out pressure relation directly. And that comes to somewhere here that we substitute the pre whatever we have calculated in previous slide substitute here and integrate it. When we do integration what we are going to get something like this that is a huge such a huge term is going to get converted in very small term of course, we are here 24 and 12 naturally one half of that this is only the 2 minus epsilon divided by 1 minus epsilon square very short term easy to understand, easy to remember and easy to plot also. Well, huge term which is required for the derivation can be simplified, it is simplified in this relation for constant volume pop, right. So, this uh, W has been represented in terms of uh, viscosity. So, we say that when we pump liquid with a higher viscosity load carrying capacity is going to be higher side, if we are going for larger radius load carrying capacity is going to be higher. If we pump too much liquid load carrying capacity is going to be higher, if we reduce the clearance load carrying capacity will be higher and epsilon remaining is an epsilon. Now, let me plot it, see I am talking about the negative eccentricity also, talking about the positive eccentricity also. You can see the load sensitivity in when it we are talking the positive sensitivity, a positive eccentricity is increasing drastically. That is a nice thing. As it goes closer and closer, load carrying capacity is going to be increased phenomenally. And generally, we say that this kind of a, a initial approximation will not be able to provide when we talk about eccentricity more than 0.9 or even the 0.8 also. That is why it has been cut to the 0.6. When you go for 0.8, we will, will be getting very high eccentricity, uh, high value of uh, load carrying capacity. And beyond that, reliability of this relation uh, will decrease. Nonlinearity is not been accounted properly. We require regress analysis for that purpose. That is why we say that um, we can uh, if we try to find out uh, using this relation high eccentricity, what will be getting unnecessary very high load carrying capacity. I remember one example we say that when um, eccentricity was a 0.93 and we estimated the error uh, which was obtained in the load was more than 2000 percent. That is a phenomenally high error. That is why we do not use a very simple expressions for high eccentricity value because non unity level is going to be increased very, very high. And this pairing of this expression with assumption was the bearings are not touching each other, there is a no uh, interlocking of asperities, will never give eccentricity 0.999 something and load carrying capacity. Um, will be always on higher. So, it will not reach to that high level of eccentricity. Now, this is a given uh, result and you say that negative side is also mentioned over here. Yes, in point, uh, my, uh, minus 0 0.2, point minus 0 0.4, minus 6, you can see that the shaft is elevated beyond its uh, uh, bearing center. And this is important when we are talking about the multi recess screw. Now, what we say that we can start with one groove. We have, we, if I know, we know that about uh, value of eccentricity 
or we know the position, we can find out what will be eccentricity for this slot, what will be eccentricity for this slot, what will be eccentricity for this slot. And we are talking always about the even number of slots. So, can whatever we are uh, pumping liquid from here, similarly we are pumping from that side, we can find out the force balance, okay, whatever eccentricity this side or that side that is going to give force component in this direction, force component in that direction. Overall, this shaft going to be located somewhere under static condition and that is a beauty of hydrostatic bearing. Location point, it is always giving the good results, very good results to control the position of shard, hydrostatic bearings are giving the best results. So, we can uh, say to understand this, let us take one simple example. Say there is a bearing having a diameter of 101.6 mm diameter, which so the journal is uh, the not bearing, the journal diameter is 101.6 mm, is resting in a bearing of diameter 101.9 mm. 101.9 mm. Yeah, so this difference it will be the diametral difference. Diametral uh, clearance will be given by this. If you want the radial clearance, naturally it will be 50 percent of this. And it has been lubricated with viscosity, or the viscous liquid, which has a viscosity as a 30 millipascal second, or 30 into 10 to minus 3 pascal second. This bearing is subjected to some group pressure or the supply of pressure been uh, supply of pressure has been uh, given or is the liquid been supplied with some pressure the APS at the lowest point. So, whatever the example we consider the bearing this example is a similar kind of thing. Length of bearing has been defined as a 152.4 mm and applied load on the bearing obviously the applied load on the shaft which need to be bared by the bearing is a 1600 or uh, 16,000 Newton, 16 kilo Newton. So, what is the question? We say what is the inlet pressure, what will be supply pressure and what is the flow rate? Uh, what inlet pressure and flow rate are needed to raise this journal, this journal by 0 0.0508 mm. So, indirectly this is going to give us eccentricity ratio. Bearing dimension have been defined, viscosity has been defined, bearing length has completely been defined and the applied load has been given to us. You see, this is an example related to this kind of configuration. Lowest point pressure has been supplied, this shaft is going to get levitated. The levitation is given as a 0 .0, 0 0.0508 mm. And we can use a load relation because a load is been given to us. So, 16,000 Newton load is been given. Viscosity is defined. Radius of the shaft is given. CR is given. Eccentricity has been defined. So, what we can get from this equation, this Q. We can determine what will be the value of the Q for this 16,000 Newton load. We can do that. So, W is uh, 16,000, viscosity is a 30 into 10 to minus 3 Pascal second, radius is a 50 percent of this that is a 0 0.5 into 101.6 mm, CR is a 50 percent of this difference of so 50, 0 0.5 into 101.9 101 minus 101.6 mm and then the eccentricity will be 1 minus because we tell that it is touching here, eccentricity will be equal to 1. So, this ratio will be 1 minus whatever the position divided by CR and that is going to give the eccentricity ratio from here. And actually, if it is uh, above this or we said this value is a uh, more than the radial clearance, then we need to sum up. Eccentricity will be more than 1 or it will be otherwise a negative sign. We can do or uh, we can directly calculate from this also. If it is more than that, then the value will turn out to be negative, that is fine for us. Now, we can use a simple algorithm, we say that in this case we are been defined the way it is shown here 0 0.5 into 101 minus 9 div, uh, sorry 101.9 minus 101.6 and it has been converted to the meters. This unit is in mm and we need to convert in meters because we are dealing with a Pascal and the Pascal it is a Newton per meter square. So, that is been uh, given over here then uh, we have epsilon. Uh, that is also been defined over here. 
it is uh, here you say that uh, this value C r already been converted to the meters, we need to convert this value in meters also. So, that is a 0 0.0508 into 10 is to minus 3 because of the meters, C r is already in the meters. So, it can calculate the results, then this q is given by rearranging the equation q can be given as a w into C r q into 1 minus epsilon square divided by 12 eta r square into bracket 2 minus epsilon and that has been given here w C r q 1 minus epsilon square divided by 12 eta r square and 2 minus epsilon has been given over here and we say the radius is the 50 percent of diameter and this is the parameter input parameter we know the 16000 has been defined viscosity is a given as a 30 millipascal second or 0 0.03 and diameter of a shaft is been given that is a 0 0.1016 meter. When we solve it what we are going to get the radial clearance is roughly 0.15 mm that is a 0.00015 meter and epsilon when we calculate using this relation is turning out to 0 0.66 and we can say this is a still in um, um, easy range we can calculate using our uh, analytical expressions of course, if this value is turning out to be more, point, more than 0 0.9 naturally we will not be able to utilize this relation because uh, whatever we get it will not be reliable. And based on that what we can be able to find out what will be value of the q in meter q per unit second. This much flow rate has been supplied or will be given to sustain this load with uh, this eccentricity. So, that is what is been asked uh, what will be the flow rate it has been calculated. However, the, this pressure what we say that uh, what should be the pressure it has not been calculated using this relation. So, we need to use second relation for pressure supply or supply pressure and that is a given over here. So, something like a supply pressure P s can be given in terms of 12 or eta q, q is a now new we are knowing it and b here in a previous relation we were not use a b, but now we are using b here the length of the bearing or length of the uh, pocket is been utilized completely here and that this relation is uh, in terms of epsilon. We know the epsilon we can directly use the resolution and get the overall results. Now, this is a uh, overall solution we say cr epsilon q r here p s has been defined p s has been given out here. And, uh, just for simplifying this expression instead of uh, writing epsilon into epsilon what we have done uh, s q e or s q epsilon is epsilon into epsilon because it has been utilized a number of primes. So, 1 s q e uh, 1 s q epsilon s q epsilon here s q epsilon here s q epsilon here. So, instead of doing a 4 times calculation for we are doing an algorithm we do only one time calculation and remaining time we are substituting the this results. So, this will be giving the slightly faster results we know this uh, overall solution comes much lesser than one second. So, when this step is not going to simplify much maybe uh, one uh, microsecond lesser uh, than that or maybe some change, but it will be always a good practice to obtain this instead of doing the four time calculation do one time calculation and substitute remaining uh, time. Now, when we uh, see the inputs this uh, load input viscosity input diameter of shaft is input and length of the bearing as input what are the output radial clearance which we uh, um, find using this relation first relation that is in uh, meters of or uh, 0.00015 meter epsilon q which we find in meter cube per second then radius and then there is a p s this is a critical parameter it is in a pascal you say the r the 6 is a almost a 1.4 mega pascal uh, we need to supply pressure more than 14 bars that is a huge pressure 14 bar to levitate this shaft and what is uh, being supported only 16 kilo newton load not very large load. So, to uh, and that we again we are assuming here 9 uh, 90 degree expand of the cavity otherwise it will not be 90 degree. We will uh, continue with uh, general bearing operation and uh, maybe we will try to relate this hydrostatic bearing with the 
hydronomic bearing because uh, hydrostatic bearing may not be very useful in absolute sense in the major areas and number of application. They are very uh, specialized applications for the hydrostatic bearing. But the hydronomic bearing is very general application used uh, almost in every uh, machineries that can be uh, coupled with hydrostatic bearing. And uh, we will continue, we will start with hydrostatic bearing uh, in next lecture, we will continue with hydrodynamic bearing after that. Thank you, thanks for your attention.